Uh, my name is Jesse James Garrett, and I uh, started a company back in 2001 called Adaptive Path. Uh, we're a user experience consulting firm based in San Francisco, uh, which is a very long way from here, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, I have, I've been doing this work, user experience work, for a pretty long time now. Adaptive Path is uh, 11 years old, and I was doing it for a few years before that. And uh, I feel really very fortunate to have been part of the, uh, the emergence of user experience as a field. It's been uh, a fascinating and uh, exhilarating time to, uh, to do this kind of work. When I started out doing this kind of work, I started out working on things that looked like that. Um, and pretty much uh, in the mid to late 90s, if anybody was talking about user experience at all, they tended to be talking about the web because the web was this exciting emerging thing that, uh, uh, that was getting a lot of attention. There were a lot of people uh, trying to figure out how to make sense of this new medium, how to, how to use it. Uh, but as, so as the conversation about user experience grew, uh, we saw that, uh, that scope of user experience expand and people started talking about, well, hey, you know, we've got, uh, now we've got a pretty sophisticated understanding of how to create experiences on the web, but isn't the web really just a special form of software? And couldn't we apply those tools there? And so then you started seeing user experience departments emerging uh, within software makers. And then the realm of software itself started to expand and we started seeing people talking about user experience in the context of any kind of digital media, even something like Second Life, if you guys remember that, but back when that was the future. And, uh, and then even beyond that, we started to look at how user experiences could be delivered really with any kind of technology. Uh, the explosion of uh, mobile devices and other kinds of consumer electronics all demanded uh, user experience work. And then, well, we're looking at technology and we're like, well, really, this is all just any kind of product has a user experience, right? And can't we apply the tools that we've created to things that are not even technological in nature? And in fact, looking even beyond products themselves to things like services, and, and we, can, we can design the experiences of those things too. And then looking even beyond services to the environments in which products and services are situated and the experiences that those deliver. Until finally you get to where we are today where um, a lot of the, the, the greatest excitement around user experience is uh, not about products or services in and of themselves, but about this larger possibility to create uh, experiences that represent this integration of products and services and environments in this multi-channel, uh, cross-channel or omni-channel experience for people. Now, what this story tells is, uh, is about the, uh, the growing recognition of a pattern. We see this pattern over and over again, starting with the web and then moving on to software and then other kinds of products and services and so forth. Now, if somebody sees a pattern everywhere they go, there are only two conclusions that you can possibly draw from that. Either they're really onto something or they're crazy. <laughs> So, and some people have actually looked at, uh, at the field of user experience and decided that these people are crazy. Uh, because it really is true that once you start noticing the pattern, you start seeing it everywhere. And so there's a sense in which the user experience mindset is an acquired condition for which there is no cure. And people who are skeptical about user experience design um, have trouble with this, with the breadth of the conversation about user experience. Uh, and, and they ask, how can one field encompass so many different things? How can it possibly be just one thing, user experience design? Um, well, I think that that in itself comes from the nature of what we deal with itself, which is the realm of experience. 
which is a difficult thing to get a handle on. I mean, anytime you start talking about experience, you, the conversation almost immediately goes in this weird philosophical kind of space because of the nature of experience. It's subjective. Everyone has their own point of view. Uh, it's ephemeral. It's, it's fleeting. And ultimately, it's intangible. It's this thing that uh, is there, and it just sort of slips away, and it's gone. And so a lot of people, I think, have rightly asked, well, how can you possibly design something that is subjective, ephemeral, and intangible? How can that be the result of design as an activity? And, they, and people draw the conclusion that experience can't be designed. You might be designing something else, but you're not actually designing experiences. And I think that this, <clears throat> this comes from uh, different people's ideas about what you mean when you talk about design. Um, you know, historically, when people have thought about design as, a, as an activity, um, they think about it in these really concrete terms. Uh, in fact, really, for the entire history of design as a, as a field, any uh, notion of design has been really uh, closely associated with mastery of a medium. That's what a designer does, is they, they dig into a medium, they really understand it, they learn how to shape it and craft it, and that's what design as an activity is. But for us, we aren't necessarily working within a medium. And we, in order to really understand our own work effectively, uh, have to move beyond this mindset that has design being so closely tied to a medium, this, this, this mindset that I think of as mediumism. But rather than um, getting freaked out by this notion of uh, practicing de design beyond medium, I, I feel like what is required of us is to embrace it and to explore it and to imagine what it could be like to do design work that is not tied to a specific medium. Because the thing that I think is the common thread among all of these different areas and, and, and possible uh, avenues for user experience design to happen are the users. Uh, and I think that it's important to remember that word and what that word means. Because what all of these different facets of user experience design have in common is that uh, we create things that people use as opposed to things that people may merely consume or uh, appreciate the way that you might appreciate um, a piece of art or architecture. And use entails some deeper connection with the things that we create. It requires something from the, uh, the people uh, who engage with it. And that engagement is the ultimate goal of any work that we do, creating experiences for users regardless of the specific context, whether it's the web or mobile or products or services. It's always about engagement. So this is the way that I think about user experience design. It is the design of anything used by people, independent of medium or across media, with human experience as an explicit outcome and human engagement as an explicit goal. I think this is the thing that ties together all of these different ways of thinking about and talking about and practicing user experience design across web and mobile and products and services and so forth. So then the question becomes, if engagement is the one common goal that every user experience design activity has, how do we create engagement? How do we understand all of the different ways that humans can be engaged with an experience? Now, designers historically have been uh, most concerned with engagement in the area of perception. Uh, in other words, engagement of the senses. Uh, there's, a, there's a great rich body of, um, of 
knowledge and understanding about how to, how to create this kind of engagement. Uh, but not all of that knowledge comes from within the realm of design. I'm going to start this one over. He's going to sing the aria, or he's going to draw the gun. The cinematographer's job is to tell people where to look. Say, look at this. There's the woman. She's going to weep, and she's going to sing the aria, or he's going to draw the gun, or, you know, he feels okay, but behind him is an ape, and you better look at the ape. We do some things that we don't even realize we're doing until we see the film put together. And, and we did them out of instinct, and we didn't know exactly why. And they work for the picture. And, and it's very hard to express a reason for it, but it's there. The great cinematographers are able to uh, understand the stories they're trying to tell and find those elusive visual images that, that help uh, to tell that story. A great DP adds to the material that already exists and really works to understand the subject matter and the language of the director they're working with. I think visually. I think of how if you turned off the soundtrack, anybody would uh, stick around and, uh, and, and figure out what was going on. There's just every technique visually. Uh, there's a language far more complex than words. A language far more complex than words. Uh, this is uh, from a documentary called Visions of Light, which is about um, the art and the craft of cin cinematography. And uh, if, you, if you just listen to the language that they use when they talk about what they do, it sounds so much like what we do in trying to create engagement on that level of uh, visuals. But there are a lot of these uh, kinds of sources of ins inspiration that we can draw on uh, to understand better how to create engagement. I would argue that this guy, uh, Ludwig von Beethoven, was an experienced designer. He had his, he had his deliverable, uh, which he then uh, shipped to his implementation team. But what ultimately got created for the audience? the experience of music, subjective, ephemeral, intangible, deliberately crafted and shaped by the composer, delivered by the orchestra. But you know, the, uh, the experience of sound doesn't have to grab you the way that Beethoven does uh, and, uh, and demand that, that engagement from you in that same way. This is a piece from Brian Eno's 1978 album, Music for Airports, which was a conscious experiment in creating music that was not designed to stand alone, but in fact was designed to be part of a larger experience, designed to be situated within a physical environment, uh, not grabbing you and, and pulling you into it the way that Beethoven does, but really being integrated into this larger experience. Something. Uh, much more subtle. I have one last example of uh, engagement of the senses that I want to share with you, uh, because you know it's we always talk about um, the uh, the visual and the auditory aspects of uh, of experience design, but experience design really extends across all of our senses. Oh, I have got to teach you about food. Close your eyes. Now take a bite. Of this. Ow, no, ow, no, ow, no! Ow. Don't just hork it down. Too late. <laughs> Here, that chew it slowly. Mm. Only think about the mm. taste. Uh, see? Not really. Creamy, salty, sweet, an oaky nuttiness. You detect that? 
Oh, I'm detecting nuttiness. Close your eyes. Now taste this. A whole different thing, right? Sweet, crisp, slight tang on the finish. Okay. Now, try them together. Okay. I think I'm getting a little something there. The nuttiness. See? Could be the tang. That's it. Now, imagine every great taste in the world being combined into infinite combinations of taste that no one has tried yet. Discoveries to be made! I think. Uh-huh. You lost me again. Ah, yeah. But that was interesting. <laughs> uh, there's one more sense that I want to talk about um, as a, a way of creating engagement which you don't hear much about, um, but I think is increasingly important, especially as you look at um, uh, physical environments um, or any kind of uh, immersive experience, uh, which is the sense of balance and motion, uh, which is a, a real sense um, in the same, just in the same way of any of our other senses. The scientific term for it is proprioception. Uh, and the I want to share a couple of examples of the way that that sense can be engaged um, from the world of video games. Um, this first one, there's a lot going on here, but what I would like you to pay attention to is uh, the way that the camera moves, because the camera represents the player's point of view. And this is the way that the game immerses the player in the experience. There's this. Despite the chaos, there's this smoothness, this fluidity to the way that the player moves. Especially, he's going to jump right here. This perfect geometric arc of a jump. And so, this smoothness uh, of the uh, of, of the of motion gives the player a sense of control and immersion within within this environment. Now, that's that is that's a game called Halo 3 uh, for the Xbox, and it's a it's a pretty typical of the way that uh, cameras work in in games. Uh, I want to share another example with you of a game that took a slightly different approach. called Mirror's Edge, and uh, basically this is what you do in the game. You, you run and jump along rooftops, and uh, the goal is to make the player always feel slightly like they're about to lose control. And so what they do with this really very realistic uh, first-person camera work uh, is to really immerse you in that sense of uh, being on the edge of losing control. And uh, one of the things that happened with this game when it came out uh, was that a lot of uh, really very experienced, very savvy gamers had a pretty strong reaction to it. Um, uh, people who spend hours and hours a day uh, sitting in front of video games, uh, playing them, sat down with Mirror's Edge, and they all got motion sickness. It was, uh, sorry to subject you to that right after lunch. Um, so there's, there's some examples of the ways in which we create engagement of the senses in the realm of perception. But this is only part of uh, creating human experiences, right? It's not, it ju doesn't just involve our, our senses. Uh, we also create engagement uh, uh, through action, um, engagement of the body. Now, when we think of engaging the body, we often we think, uh, lately, we we'll think of something like this, like the like the motion controls on the on the Wii, but really, if you think about any kind of interactivity, ultimately, it ends up taking some kind of physical form, even as, if it's just a click of the mouse. But even the pursuit of this physical engagement can be taken too far. Using your computer's camera and a spatial tracking algorithm. Gmail Motion interprets physical movement and turns it into actionable commands. For example, to open a message, make a motion as if you were opening an envelope. To reply, simply point backward with your thumb. To reply all, use both hands. 
to send a message, lick a stamp, and place it down. <laughs> We've been working with experts in motion technology and semiotics to develop a language of movements that replaces type entirely. The movements are designed to be intuitive, ergonomic, and easy to do. So this was a, an April Fool's joke that, uh, that Google did a couple of years ago, but uh, it kind of points at um, the, um, the potential for absurdity in this, uh, in this pursuit of um, engaging people uh, through action, the physical action. Uh, in addition to perception, perception and action, there's a, there's a third component to this, which is uh, the realm of cognition, uh, engagement of the mind. Now, uh, we actually talk a, a lot about this um, in the context of the web, because uh, the web so often is a medium for information consumption. And this kind of information processing uh, is one of the core forms of this engagement of the mind. Uh, but there, but engagement of the mind can actually take many different forms. I'm, I'm working on beating that time. I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet, but... Um, so being mindful of uh, the ways in which we engage people's cognitive abilities in an experience is a, the third dimension of it. And then the fourth part is, uh, is the realm of emotion, uh, engaging people's hearts. And uh, this is an area that has uh, started getting more and more attention in the context of user experience design uh, through books like Donald Norman's book, uh, Emotional Design, among many others. And again, uh, there is a rich tradition and heritage that we can draw on uh, to create experiences that create this kind of emotional engagement. So in doing any kind of user experience design, independent of medium or across medium, or across media, these are the four major considerations, the, the, uh, the areas in which engagement happens. Uh, perception, engagement of the senses. Action, engagement of the body. Cognition, engagement of the mind and emotion, engagement of the heart. Perception and action representing a kind of external engagement, the engagement between the user and the world. And then cognition and emotion, the kind of engagement that happens internally, what's going on in their heads and their hearts. It also makes a nice four-letter acronym, which I'm fond of. Now, some of you may be uh, familiar with this. Um, this is something that I did a long time ago now uh, to talk about uh, breaking down user experience and um, helping to explain uh, what goes into user experience work to other people. At that time, uh, I was working on the web, and so my focus really was on uh, what it took to create websites. Uh, but as my thinking has evolved, I start to see the way that all of these components of this model, the elements of user experience model, uh, actually fit really nicely into this model. You see how all of those uh, pieces kind of intersect. But there are a few more considerations that I want to bring into this that affect the experiences that people have. The first of these are uh, people's capabilities. We need to be aware of um, what, uh, what people can and uh, what people can do and what people can sense and um, taking everything from uh, this kind of stuff into account. So this is, um, uh, there is an entire field called anthropometrics which specializes in mapping the physical capabilities of the human body. Um, it's uh, something that is referenced a lot in, in, in industrial design. Uh, but those capabilities uh, aren't always things that you can simply uh, measure and map out like that. Uh, sometimes uh, the way that people's capabilities come into play are a little bit more subtle. In addition to people's uh, capabilities, we have to take into account their constraints. Uh, not just what they can do, but what they can't do. Um, those constraints can be, uh, they can be physical constraints. 
Uh, they can be cognitive constraints. Uh, they can be emotional constraints. Uh, all of these constraints uh, additionally have to be taken into consideration. And lastly, we have context. And context is, uh, it's a big subject because uh, there are so many different forms of context. But it's really, really vital because the experience that you ultimately have in a lot of ways depends on what you bring to it, whether you see uh, the faces or the vase depends on that context. And these different kinds of context all potentially come into play in all of these different areas as we look at uh, how that shapes the experience that people have. So capabilities, defining what people can do, context or constraints, defining what they can't do, and the context that shapes those ultimately influences the experience that people have in each of these four areas. And so this starts to give us a way to understand not just how to do user experience design, but really how all different kinds of design happen. Uh, because there's a thread through all of these fields of trying to create engagement in these specific ways. Uh, but for us as user experience designers, what we end up doing is having to step back and look at the bigger picture. Uh, because doing this is really hard and really complicated and not necessarily something that can be uh, easily accomplished with a set of design tools from one medium or another medium. Uh, ultimately, delivering on the promise of user experience design comes down to orchestration, uh, that it's not about uh, drawing on the wisdom of one design discipline or another design discipline, but pulling all of those together and uh, applying that knowledge in the design of all of the individual parts, making sure each of those parts is sound, but then looking at how those parts come together to create the overall experience that is greater than those parts are individually. This is not a new idea. Um, about 100 years ago, the composer Claude Debussy said, music is the space between the notes. Sometimes uh, later, the, the great jazz musician Miles Davis said, don't play what's there, play what's not there. If we think of every way that we touch someone in an experience as one of these notes, uh, as an opportunity for engagement, the challenge for us as user experience designers then becomes, how do we pull those notes together? And how do we play what's not there? Thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>